Psst. Hey, you. Yes, you. Come closer. Closer. Want to hear a scary story? I must warn you, it's pretty scary. And it's a true story. It happened to me. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you my story, but if you get nightmares, don't blame me. <laughs> it happened way back in 2007. And a good friend of mine had just moved in to a new house. I came over to check out her new place, and we had dinner. And that's when it happened. Thump. Thump. We heard it from the front porch. Thump. 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 A slow, rhythmic pounding coming from somewhere out there in the twilight. Thump. 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 And that's when we saw it. A kid across the street dribbling a basketball. Okay, I, I can't, I'm not going to keep the bit up anymore, but seriously, that is the scary story. And it's true. I really did know someone who was terrified for weeks because her neighbor's kid would stand on the road across the street dribbling a basketball. She I guess she thought the kid was like dealing drugs or something. She even went so far as to installing a security camera facing out to where the kid liked to play basketball to check out what was going on with them. And she, even though she never saw the kid doing anything illegal or selling drugs or anything like that, whatever, she was just completely convinced that those neighbors across the street were like criminal kingpins or something because this kid would dribble a ball on the side of the road for like a half an hour every night. and. As you've probably guessed, yes, the kid was black, and yes, my friend was white. And of course, that had everything to do with it. If it were a white kid dribbling a basketball across the street every evening, there is a 0% chance that my friend would have wanted to call the cops on him. My friend, who was in her mid-20s and quite liberal, lived in fear of a 12-year-old kid for several weeks, which seems ridiculous. It was ridiculous, just like many of the fears that we have. But as ridiculous as fear can be, it is a powerful force which runs deep in the human psyche. And when fear and politics mix, things can get really scary. So let's take a closer look at fear. <laughs> fear, that's what this video is gonna be about. Fear is an unpleasant emotion caused by the expectation that something bad will happen. Fear in and of itself is not really good, nor is it bad. It's actually vital for our survival. Fear is often a completely rational response to dangerous situations. Like if you wake up in the middle of the night and discover that your bedroom is on fire, it's completely reasonable for you to be afraid of the fire and to want to get the hell out of there. Fear can also be irrational, of course, but most fears combine rational and irrational aspects within the human mind. For instance, I have a pretty deep fear of cockroaches. This fear is at its root pretty rational. Cockroaches do spread disease and humans should generally avoid disease and cockroaches. But if I see a roach, I completely lose it and I flee the scene. The roach wins every time. I have to get my wife Luna to come in and deal with the roach for me. Speaking of Luna, she has a relatively common fear called trypophobia. Trypophobia is the fear of small, tightly packed together holes. Don't worry if you're trypophobic, I'm not gonna put it on screen, but this phobia, it, it seems pretty irrational. It's literally just like seeing a bunch of little holes clustered tightly together or little spots or whatever. Like for instance, a lot of people think that uh, lotus seeds are terrifying if they have trypophobia. Not lotus seeds, but lotus plants, lotus pods. Again, I won't show a picture, but anyway, uh, psychologists have suggested that these phobias do have like rational roots, that they evolved in certain humans because a lot of venomous animals, for instance, have markings that look like tightly packed holes. I'm not trypophobic myself, but I do gotta admit some of the images that really upset Luna are repulsive to me. I wouldn't say I was like phobic of them, but you know, they look gross for some reason that I can't really explain. For some reason, it 
affects me to some extent, and uh, it, it affects a lot of people really gravely. It really upsets Luna when she sees certain images of tightly packed holes. Uh, so far, all of these fears that we've been discussing are more or less rooted in the material world. Fears of fire and pests and things like that evolved for our survival. Many phobias are the results of traumatic experiences in the material world, and even the more mysterious and seemingly irrational fears like trypophobia are rooted somehow somewhere in the material processes of the human brain. But the material world is not the only source of fear for human beings. We can also develop fears socially. That is to say, human beings can influence other human beings to be afraid of stuff. This kind of social fear can be very useful for humans as well. Parents can teach their kids about the dangers of crossing the road and playing with matches so that they don't have to learn from direct experience. Trainees at job sites can watch safety videos to learn about the dangers of forklifts and belt sanders and so on, so they don't have to learn the hard way. And all that stuff is pretty nifty. Healthy fear of dangerous stuff has saved countless lives, and there's a reason that we have safety instruction and protocols and that sort of thing to try to give people a healthy fear of things that can do us harm. But of course, socially ingrained fear also has a dark side, and that's because pretty much every prejudice and bigotry is ultimately rooted in socially ingrained fear. There's a reason we have words like homophobia, transphobia, xenophobia. It's because bigotry is so often rooted in fear of the other. There's a teacher named Jane Elliott who set up a situation with children in the late 60s, creating in-groups and out-groups based on eye color. It, it really is a fascinating example of otherization, and I suggest you look into it if you haven't, if you haven't already. You brown-eyed people are not to play with the blue-eyed people on the playground because you are not as good as blue-eyed people. Well, the brown-eyed people in this room today are going to wear collars so that we can tell from a distance what color your eyes are. The yardstick's gone. Well, okay. I don't see the yardstick, do you? It's probably over there. Hey, Mrs. Lake, you better keep that on your desk so if the um, brown people, brown-eyed people can get out of hand. Oh, you think if the brown-eyed people get out of hand, that would be the thing to use? And it seemed like when we were down on the bottom, everything bad was happening to us. The way they treated you, you felt like you didn't even want to try to do anything. It seemed like Mrs. Elliott was taking our best friends away from us. This is a filthy, nasty word called discrimination. We're treating people a certain way because they are different from the rest of us. Is that fair? No. no. Uh, but the point is that in order for a prejudice like xenophobia, for example, to exist, there must first be an otherization process in which people from foreign countries are categorized as an outgroup. From there, it's very easy to socially develop and spread fear of the outgroup of foreigners throughout society, as we've seen far too often. And this can be built up even more into what's known as pseudo-speciation, in which the other group, the outgroup, is no longer even considered human. This is used in military training to essentially psychologically prepare soldiers to kill other people by dehumanizing them. Sometimes these fears might have some material basis in reality. For example, it was pretty reasonable for Jewish people to develop fear of German Nazis during the Holocaust. Uh, but fear and prejudice like that can also develop for more arbitrary reasons. And such fears can be developed and manipulated intentionally for political purposes by bad faith actors. We're going to build the wall. We have no choice. We have no choice. Build that wall, 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 build that wall. As living conditions for the white working class in the USA have deteriorated due to capitalism over the last few decades, politicians and capitalists have come up with all sorts of scapegoats to blame for these problems. So, of course, immigrants, Muslims, and LGBTQ plus people have all been used as scapegoats to blame for the deterioration of conditions of life for the working class that we are facing. And this is ultimately a process of building fear of these others. 
This is why we have so many white workers in the USA blaming immigrants and workers in foreign countries for stealing jobs and degrading the quality of life for white Americans rather than capitalism for just doing what capitalism does. This kind of fear is what Marx and Engels would have called false consciousness. That is to say, ideas and emotions which do not reflect material reality. If white workers are concerned with falling wages and increased instability, they should be concerned with the capitalist wage system. But of course, the people in power under capitalism don't want us developing this kind of class consciousness. So they spend a huge amount of money and resources stoking fears and divisions and otherwise fomenting false consciousness among the working class. In the USA today, capitalism has developed the working class into a fractured mess of mutually fearful divisions. We've got a bit of a Humpty Dumpty situation on our hands, and it's the job of socialists to figure out how to put those pieces together at least enough that we can overthrow our capitalist oppressors. So now I'm gonna start talking about dialectical materialism, but if you're not familiar with it, don't get scared. My partner Loon and I have put out a few videos explaining the basics of dialectical materialism, but if you haven't seen them, no sweat. I'm gonna keep things pretty simple here. Dialectic materialism is just a way of looking at the world in terms of internal and external relationships and the ways in which things mutually impact each other. In this context, we can think of the working class as defined by internal relationships, relations between the human workers who compose the working class. And the working class is also defined by external relations, in particular, the relationship between the working class and the capitalist class. A contradiction is a relationship between two subjects which is rooted in some sort of conflict. All contradictions must be eventually resolved with one side essentially overtaking the other. We call this negation. And this will include the contradiction between the capitalist class and the working class. The capitalists want to negate this contradiction through complete subjugation of the working class. While it's in the interest of the working class, to negate this contradiction by overthrowing capitalists and building a classless society. And that's basically communism in a nutshell. Now, unfortunately, as we were just discussing, the working class is divided by fear. Distrust, prejudice, otherization, these are all processes of fear which lead to what we might call secondary contradictions. Contradictions which prevent the working class from building solidarity so that we can negate the primary contradiction of capitalist class relations. In theory, all we have to do to end capitalism is negate all those secondary contradictions which keep us divided, like transphobia, racism, xenophobia, ableism, and so on, at least to the extent that we can focus on the primary contradiction of capitalism and overthrow the capitalist ruling class. And that's precisely why the capitalist ruling class does everything it can to stoke those fears and keep us divided. Now, most socialists understand that the working class is defined by its external relations with the capitalist class, but it's easy for us to forget that it's also defined by those internal relations and the objective social relations of race, gender, sexuality, disability, and on and on and on. And if we don't recognize that these objective social relations constitute contradictions within the working class, then how can we ever hope to negate those contradictions enough to build revolutionary class consciousness? And if you don't know, an objective social relation is just a relationship that you, know, you can't touch and feel, but it does have objective impact on our reality. Capitalism is an objective social relationship. You cannot see or feel capitalism, but the relationship that capitalists have with the working class and all, all of the uh, relations that the working class has with the means of production and so on, they have real world impact on our lives and they have physical manifestations such as the poverty of those on the bottom rungs of the working class and the exorbitant wealth of those at the top of the capitalist class. Now, distrust is a form of fear. Distrust prevents human beings from working together out of fear that one side will betray the other. Sometimes it's totally rational for one group of people to distrust another group of people. If somebody has betrayed you time and time and time again, it's rational for you to learn not to trust that person. This can happen on a systemic or social scale as well. Black people in the USA have suffered so much systemic violence from white society that it's a rational survival strategy for black folks to develop a general distrust of white people. That Hurts to hear, it sucks, I don't like it, but it's a hard truth. The same goes for trans people. Given the horrifying amount of violence which trans people face from cis people, there's a material basis for fear and distrust of cis people by trans people. If you are a member of an in-group which has committed a great deal of violence and subjugation of an out-group, that is to say, if you're white, cis het, male, abled, whatever, you should respect and understand the distrust that might be leveled at you by those from the oppressed group that 
you have privilege over. Given the fact that over 90% of the indigenous people of what we now call the USA have been wiped out through genocidal colonialism, I don't just demand or expect indigenous people to trust me. I can understand why they'd be fearful and distrustful of white US Americans. And I know that the process of building trust will require a lot of collective work and sacrifice and foregoing of privilege from white folks as we work towards justice. That's just reality based on objective social relations which exist between white people like me and the indigenous folks which we have helped to subjugate. Now, as a side note, I'd like to take a moment to talk about the feelings of security, which have a dialectical relationship with fear. While fear is the concern that bad shit will happen, security is the belief that bad shit can be avoided. Fear and security have a dialectical relationship with one another. Fear determines security, while security can impact fear. Think of it this way. Nobody develops feelings of security if there isn't first some fear. We put locks on our doors so that we can feel more secure, but we wouldn't feel more secure and we wouldn't even put locks on our doors if we didn't first have some fear that others might enter our homes to do bad shit to us. Just like fear, feelings of security can be rooted in material reality, or they can be a form of false consciousness. Wearing a seatbelt while driving should give you some extra sense of security since they are proven to reduce injury and death quite a bit, but we can also develop false senses of security, and this can also be manipulated for political purposes. For example, let's take a look at rich tech workers who are currently gentrifying neighborhoods in cities like Seattle while making huge incomes from companies like Amazon and Microsoft. These workers feel so secure in their income, in their personal wealth, that they often take on the character of the petty bourgeoisie. That is to say, they can actually come to side with capitalists against less privileged working class. But this sense of security, which comes from high wages and cushy work conditions, is false consciousness, since those privileges can be revoked at any time by the ruling capitalist class. The number of people who have true security against the brutal forces of capitalism are very small. They tend to have names we know, like Jeff Bezos, and Elon Musk, and Bill Gates, and so on. I know this because I ran a marketing company back in the mid 2000s and I had quite a few clients at the time who were literally millionaires who paid me a shitload of money around 2006 and 2007 to market their tech startups and real estate investment companies. Then the financial crash happened and those people lost literally everything in very short order. I knew one guy who owned three houses and a Porsche at the beginning of 2007 and by 2009 he was living with his mom and driving a used Saturn. That's a true story, not making it up. It's not unheard of for big corporations to lay off thousands of workers without warning. It's quite common for cushy jobs to get shipped overseas where the labor can be had more cheaply and there are fewer protections and less organized workforces. Whenever capitalists determine that it's more profitable to do so, they will cut you out no matter where you are in the pyramid of capitalist hierarchy. Under capitalism, everyone is disposable in the name of profits. Just ask American factory workers. Back in the 60s, factory jobs were plentiful and they paid well. A typical factory worker could expect to own a home, provide for several kids, and retire with some security. Today, those jobs are vanishingly rare in the USA, and where factory jobs can be had, they're a lot less stable than they used to be. Right now, tech workers are on top, but technologies like artificial intelligence are developing rapidly just as foreign workers are filling in skills gaps, and a lot of those jobs are going to disappear from the USA sooner or later. In fact, in the marketing field where I come from, most of the entry-level positions that existed when I graduated from college in 2006 don't exist anymore because a lot of those jobs have become completely automated and artificial intelligence is slowly chewing up jobs upward and upward. And it's a lot harder for people to get entry-level jobs in marketing now than it was whenever I was 21 years old. So any sense of security that these cushy tech jobs might be providing today is essentially false consciousness. In reality, these high paid tech workers should have a healthy fear of their capitalist employers and solidarity with the bottom rungs of the working class because almost everyone is just a few missed paychecks away from severe financial hardship in the USA, no matter how much you're getting paid if you are a wage laborer. But false consciousness is what keeps them from having any solidarity with those more marginalized folks that they're displacing in their gentrified neighborhoods. Will these highly paid tech workers ever develop class consciousness and solidarity with the more marginalized members of society? That remains to be seen. I, for one, am somewhat skeptical. I think it's gonna take some kind of 
disastrous event, which will drive down their wages and create a lot of unemployment before they start to develop class consciousness. But I hope that they prove me wrong. I hope that if you're a highly paid tech worker in that field, that you develop class consciousness and start trying to spread it to your coworkers before it's too late for you. Because just look at history. There's no class of workers that ever stayed at the top indefinitely. Capitalism will come for you sooner or later. So this kind of false consciousness can happen along racial lines as well. My friend's fear of that kid bouncing the ball on the side of the road is a pretty good example of this kind of false consciousness. She was so afraid of a little black kid playing basketball that she seriously considered calling the cops on him for weeks and installed security cameras in her house to monitor him, even though calling the cops would have put the kid in harm's way since cops are so statistically likely to kill black kids. In that situation, she was suffering from a serious bout of double false consciousness since the cops gave her some kind of false sense of security against what amounted to be a false sense of fear. Negating this kind of deep-seated distrust is an incredibly difficult task, which is made even more difficult because of false consciousness, which stokes fears in the opposite direction, so that not only are the oppressed distrustful and fearful of their oppressors, which is rational, but oppressors are also distrustful and fearful of those they help to oppress, which is quite irrational. It makes sense for black members of the working class to have some sort of distrust of white workers, given the brutal history of violence against black people, which white workers have very willingly participated in and benefited from since the beginning of American capitalism. But what's harder to understand is the fear that so many white workers have of black people in the USA. This kind of fear has to have been socially developed since there's no real material basis for systemic fear of black people. And white capitalists have been working to exacerbate fears of black people among the working class in a variety of ways for a very long time. They use all kinds of propaganda, some of it more overt, some less. They use the media, they use Hollywood films, all kinds of things to make black people scary to white people, especially amidst the working class. In the most extreme form, oppressors are manipulated into believing that liberation of the oppressed will result in reprisals, replacement, and reverse genocide. This is most overtly revealed in the rhetoric of modern day white supremacists who invoke such slogans as the 14 words, we must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. The idea that white people are in danger of extinction is patently absurd. For one thing, there are like 700 million white people in Europe alone today, which is more than double the white population around 1900. White people have committed genocide throughout the last several centuries, but there's no material basis whatsoever for any fear that white people might become the victims of mass genocide. Hell, just the very idea of whiteness in and of itself is false consciousness, since there's no material basis for whiteness. And since it's a relatively modern invention, which developed alongside capitalism and colonialism to help with dividing and conquering the world, but that's a topic for another video, I suppose. Anyway, the fear of reprisal is based entirely on irrational paranoia that our victims will treat us the way we've treated them, even though there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever that this would or even could happen in our material reality. Now, certainly reprisals have happened historically when an oppressed population has overthrown an oppressor class. And, you know, that's, that's not nice. But the scale of atrocity and violence related to reprisals has never been comparable to the original oppression and violence which had been overthrown. And believing otherwise is false consciousness. Fear of reprisal in itself is false consciousness. And it's used to justify oppressive power structures, which cause a great deal of suffering and death, and which keep the working class divided. What's especially interesting about these fears, which white cishet men so often exhibit, is the contradiction it reveals about white cishet men. See, the white patriarchy has an obsessive fear of appearing fearful. This can very clearly be seen in the toxic masculinity of fascists and shock jocks and debate bros who try so desperately to be seen as aggressive alpha males who aren't afraid of anything. In these circles, fear is seen as weakness and opponents are accused of being afraid to debate me or ridiculed for being physically weaker or otherwise emasculated for any perceived fear or weakness. But these same people who are so obsessed with these aesthetics of not being afraid of anything are obviously defined by their irrational fear of the oppressed. They're terrified that LGBTQ plus people might receive equality in society. They're horrified 
that indigenous people might somehow rise up and commit white genocide against them uh, through the process of decolonization. They develop complex fantasies about great replacement and, and white genocide again, in which white people will be systemically wiped out when all evidence we have from history indicates that that kind of violence always goes the other way around. Fear is the driving force of these reactionary ideologies concealed only by a paper-thin facade of macho posturing. It would be kind of funny if these people weren't intensely violent and directly responsible for so much suffering all around the world. What especially concerns me lately, yes, what makes me fearful, is the way in which this kind of toxic macho fear culture has been invading leftist spaces. It's becoming increasingly common for popular white online leftist personalities to raise spurious fears of white genocide and fear of reprisal, so much so that most of the discussion of indigenous liberation I see online nowadays is centered around white fear of reprisal, with the white nationalist false conscious fantasy of white genocide being weaponized now against indigenous people from the left. I find this especially troubling because we're supposed to be the last line of defense for the people who are most oppressed in our society. We're supposed to be the ones who are leading the charge to liberate all people from all forms of oppression. We're the ones that are supposed to believe that nobody is free until everybody is free. And the only way to negate these secondary contradictions of bigotry and prejudice and to build solidarity among the working class is by diffusing these unfounded fears and de-weaponizing systems of oppression, which the capitalist class has worked so hard to build and exacerbate for centuries. We have to build class consciousness. We have to dismantle capitalist hegemony. We have to dispel false consciousness. So whenever I see these leftists out here spreading false consciousness and speculating with these white genocide fantasies, these hypotheticals that have no bearing in reality, and forcing indigenous people to constantly address their completely fictitious fears. Give it a hundred years, you know, Africa's growing pretty fast. I guarantee you that <laughs> give it a little bit of time, you, you motherfuckers are going to end up being just as dangerous. Okay. When it comes to South Africa, what do you think of the six million white people who live in that country? Do you think the black people, who are by far the majority, have a right to remove the white population? My point is, is that the people who colonize those people, if the people who are there and they live in their own country don't want to live with people who are colonized, they should have the right to determine if they want to live with those people or not. I think that could look like a number of things. It could look like a number of things. And, oh God, I can't believe we're doing this discourse yet again. But whilst, yes, it could look like a number of things, you could ask them nicely. You could, as the South African government, you could put on a nice tea party for the white people and ask them nicely to leave. And they wouldn't, because that's not how that fucking works. Ultimately, we have seen, time and time and time again, the idea of peaceful ethnic cleansing, the idea of some sort of ethical removal of people, isn't possible. I have nothing against minorities, but what happens when there's more of them than there is of us? It really makes me sad. Okay, I gotta stop here and talk about this a little bit because I know that this is going to make a lot of people pissed off that I just showed those clips and people are gonna say all kinds of stuff to try to justify this kind of rhetoric. And the thing about it is I gotta speak up about this because it's extremely disturbing to me and I'm not trying to start drama and I don't want to cancel anybody, but it's just such a disturbing pattern to me. Listen, first of all, at this point in time, whether you're talking about land back in the USA or, or any kind of decolonization project anywhere in the world, I'm not aware of a single realistically feasible movement to quote unquote ethnic cleanse white people anywhere in the world. There's just nowhere where that is being seriously considered by a majority of indigenous people. And there's nowhere where that could happen, even if they wanted to do that. Take, for example, the United States of America, where you have something like 3 million indigenous people because they've just been so wiped out. They have been genocided. The indigenous people have been genocided so much. There's not even a feasible path to kicking out the 330 million non-indigenous people in the USA. It's a completely hypothetical scenario. Same with South Africa. I've had so many people message me since the last video in which I addressed this from South Africa, white South Africans and black South Africans, who told me that they're glad to see people talking about this because it's just not something that's on the table at all in South Africa. It's a 
hypothetical moralizing that centers white people unnecessarily and stokes fears of white genocide that come directly from fascists and white nationalists. And I find it really, really disturbing that this kind of rhetoric is becoming so common on the left among white leftists. Now, Luna and I have a three-part series on our Highlights channel about Marxist morality, and I really encourage you to check that out uh, if you're interested in this kind of uh, discourse. But there's a reason that people like Professor Flowers, black people and indigenous people, don't want to engage with this kind of rhetoric. And there's a reason why they say we need to listen to indigenous people about their struggles. Let's look at Vietnam. Vietnam is a country that was colonized brutally by France, Japan, and the USA for centuries. And guess what? They kicked out all the white people twice, and they kicked out all the Japanese people as well. They kicked out the French, they kicked out the Japanese, they kicked out US American soldiers. There are rare exceptions. With the French, there was a small number of soldiers who stayed and fought with the Vietnamese to fight for Vietnamese liberation. Those people are heralded as heroes today in Vietnam. With the Japanese, there were a few hundred Japanese soldiers who switched sides and fought for Vietnamese liberation. They are also heralded as heroes and quote unquote honorary Vietnamese today. But with the United States of American soldiers, there were millions of US American soldiers in Vietnam and the Vietnamese dropped pamphlets and made broadcasts on the radio and for 10 years urging U.S. American soldiers to switch sides and fight for Vietnamese liberation. Not a single U.S. American soldier joined that side. Defect GI. It is a very good idea to leave a sinking ship. Now, when the French and the Japanese and the U.S. Americans were occupying Vietnam, they had their families with them. They had children with them. The French stayed for generations. Even the descendants of the original French soldiers who came originally uh, were kicked out you know, during the liberation struggle, with the, with the exception of those people who fought for Vietnamese liberation. Are you going to tell me that that's ethnic cleansing? Are you going to tell me that that was inappropriate? Are you going to say that the Vietnamese should have allowed those French colonists to stay there? I also want to point out that the Vietnamese did let the United States of American colonists and the French colonists and the Japanese colonists leave peacefully. They didn't round them up and murder them. The quote-unquote fall of Saigon was a peaceful transition of power and all the American civilians were allowed to leave without anyone being murdered or ethnically cleansed or whatever you want to call it. It had been a very disciplined arrival, the result of careful and detailed planning in which every unit knew precisely where to go and what to do. And it had all gone without a hitch. If the French had won the Battle of Dien Bien Phu and stayed as colonizers in Vietnam to this day, then the Vietnamese would be accused of being, you know, ethnic cleansers and white genociders if they discussed decolonization today, which I find tragic. Today, French people live in Vietnam again. I'm a white person, I live in Vietnam. But we white people no longer subjugate the Vietnamese. That's a huge difference. There are tens of thousands of white people in Vietnam today. So you can't say that this is like some ethnic state where they just ethnic cleansed everybody. No, they kicked the colonizers out they got self-determination, and now they welcome foreigners like me. I have a resident card. I'm married to a Vietnamese person. I'm welcome here today. I'm treated very, very kindly by the Vietnamese people. But I'm not here to subjugate, and I don't have the power to subjugate Vietnam anymore. It's a huge difference. That's the difference between being colonized and having self-determination. So the two things that really bother me about this trend in rhetoric are, number one, it's based on complete hypothetical fear of the oppressed. And number two, it centers white people as hypothetical victims, again, rooted in this kind of fear of the hypothetical. Whether or not it's appropriate to kick out settlers like the Vietnamese did is based purely in the material conditions of the time. When the Vietnamese people chose to kick the French settlers out, it was completely appropriate to do so. They militarily defeated the French and they pushed them out. Now, the French people had the choice at the time to stay and fight for the Vietnamese and their liberation, but they chose to fight to maintain their own power. That's what made it appropriate. Those material conditions are what made it appropriate for the Vietnamese to kick the French out. So when indigenous people and black people 
avoid these kinds of completely hypothetical questions, it's because they know it's just going to depend on the circumstances and how things work out in material reality. At this point, nobody is considering kicking all the white South Africans out, so it's absurd to bring it up. If things develop to the point where that comes to be some kind of possibility in the material world, then it's impossible to say whether or not it will be appropriate or not at that time because it's a future scenario and we can't predict the future. It's just like asking the question, is it acceptable to kill somebody? The only rational answer to that question is maybe it depends. Sometimes it is obviously acceptable to kill somebody like in self-defense, right? And it's the same thing with like the question of, is it acceptable to kick settlers out? The only rational answer to a hypothetical question that's that broad and that vague is maybe it depends. Okay, back to the video. So if you're a communist or an anarchist with some kind of systemic privilege, if you're white like me, if you're cis, hell, whatever, and you want to build solidarity among the working class, you've got to examine these fears of reprisal which have been ingrained into you by the capitalist hegemony, and you have to work to dismantle it. As long as you are fixated on fears that liberating the oppressed will lead to reprisals against you, as long as you're centering yourself and your privilege, instead of centering the plight of those who have been most marginalized and subjugated by the forces of capitalism, you will be a barrier and a hindrance to building class consciousness. Hey, just wanna break in here again and talk about some parallels I'm seeing between these white leftists today who seem so concerned with you know fear of reprisal and, and white genocide. And some of the things we saw last year during the uh, George Floyd uprisings, you know, uh, most of the leftists that I'm aware of were really annoyed by white liberals or any, any liberals that were kind of pearl clutching about the destruction of Starbucks and, you know, businesses and that sort of thing during the uprising. And, you know, we even had people like Destiny who said that it was absolutely okay for fascists to literally mow down protesters if they were causing property destruction. The rioting needs to fucking stop. And if that means like white redneck fucking militia dudes out there mowing down dipshit protesters that think that they could torch buildings at 10 p.m., then at this point they have my fucking blessing because holy shit, this fucking shit needs to stop. It needed to stop a long time ago. Like, holy you fuck. Think... And I find these parallels really disturbing. I mean, we have people who are so concerned with some hypothetical scenario in which they might be harmed that they end up siding against liberation action and they end up centering themselves as the oppressor group as the privileged group. And I find that to be what I would call political cowardice. Ho Chi Minh talked a lot about proletarian piety, which is the idea that we should love and trust the oppressed and the working class. And Ho Chi Minh also pointed out that nobody will love you simply for being a communist. The people are not going to gather around you and listen to what you have to say just because you say you're there to liberate them. They're going to be focused on your actions. And the actions of these people who are harassing and defaming and just basically trying to stoke fear about indigenous and black people and uh, trans people and oppressed people trying to, to win their liberation. I mean, that to me g runs counter to everything that we on the left should be focused on. The fact is there's always some chance that there might be some kind of reprisal if oppressed people are liberated. Because by definition, if you're giving a group of people more power and self-determination, then they will have the capacity to do things that might cause you harm. Yes, that's, that's a risk that comes with liberating people, but that's certainly not an excuse to pump the brakes on liberation activity. I'm struck by a podcast I listened to back around March of this year in which a black activist who was, you know, out there confronting cops and putting his life and his safety and his freedom on the line in, in this really, really dangerous environment. And the interviewer asked him, you know, isn't there a safe way to do this? I wish that there was, you know, I hope that there's a safe way to do it. And this is what that activist said. There's not. And if there was, we would have gone about it that way. But every time that we go safely about it, nothing happens. <laughs> there is no safe way of doing this. I'm sorry. So if this black activist can go out and put his very life on the line for liberation, even in the situation where he's much more likely to be 
harmed or killed by the police in the world we live in right now, it strikes me as particularly cowardly for people with far more privilege, you know, white people, cis people, heterosexual people, whatever, you know, whatever category you want to you want to discuss. It strikes me as particularly cowardly for those people to be so concerned with some hypothetical future in which they might the victims might become the oppressors or whatever. I mean, we have a situation right now where people are actively being oppressed and to center yourself and your concern for some hypothetical future over the active ongoing suffering of marginalized people today right now, how are you ever going to build solidarity with that kind of attitude? Okay, just wanted to share those thoughts. Now back to the regularly scheduled video. It's not enough for you to be not racist, not bigoted. You have to be anti-racist, anti-bigoted. You have to have the confidence and the bravery to step up and defend people who are being oppressed and whose oppression you are benefiting from, at least indirectly. Centering your own concerns about whatever hypothetical reprisal those oppressed people might enact against you if they're liberated is not the way forward for privileged anarchists and communists and socialists. If you are gripped by the fear that liberating an oppressed group will lead to reprisals against you because you benefit from oppression, what does that say about your priorities? It says that you're willing to maintain your position of relative privilege if it means saving your own skin. It means that you're more afraid of those who are more oppressed than you than you are of the primary enemy of the capitalist ruling class. That is the kind of fear and weakness which we must eradicate from our liberation movement. We can't eliminate fear and distrust by ignoring it, by pretending it doesn't exist. We have to recognize the objective social relations of prejudice and bigotry rooted in fear, which keep the working class so incredibly divided. And we have to muster the courage to eradicate fears which are rooted in false consciousness while recognizing the bases for fear and distrust which are rooted in reality. We have to be able to tell the difference. Some fear and distrust is warranted in society, and the only way to dismantle that fear and distrust is through the hard work of building solidarity, which will require white communists and anarchists to willingly risk the very, very insignificant threat of reprisal by liberating people who are most oppressed. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be a very long process. And I don't have all the answers for how we do it, but I can tell you one thing, as long as the people with the most privilege are terrified through false consciousness of the people who are the most oppressed, we will never unite the working class. There are those who say that the best way to unite the working class is by ignoring divisions like race, gender, sexuality, ableism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That makes absolutely no fucking sense to me whatsoever. I'm American Johnson. This is the end of the video. Fear not, for we will be back soon. And the reason why is because we are supported by our awesome comrades on Patreon, camaraderie. And oh, if you are not already subscribed to the Non-Compete Live channel, go check it out. YouTube.com slash Non-Compete Live. This Halloween night, we'll be doing a fundraiser for the International Anti-Fascist Defense Fund, and we'll be playing Super Mario Brothers. It's going to be a great time. Hope to see you there. Happy Halloween! Unless it's after Halloween. Shifting sands like chronos, holding more be golden. I see ghosts, just ghosts. Tipping hands like mad men, holding moldy corpses. I see ghosts, just ghosts. Dark side, I was born to devils with the blood of gods. Big men and glow burn mentals, I was quickly just forgot. You blue-eyed people are not allowed to be on the playground equipment at any time.